most money uh, locked up from uh, different companies in, in all of this. So the impact is, has been uh, big, I mean, a huge negative, and we've been digging ourselves up from, from that. But very specifically, uh, we wanted to give you a petition, which I will explain it just briefly. Um, and we've also made it as brief as, as we can. So I want to give you this, this, um, uh, this petition. And this petition, um, simply, we, we, we believe, we believe that when you take a look at it, um, you will understand the, the, the reasons why we believe that anyone who will occupy the seat of the presidency should take a look at all of what had happened uh, with the so-called financial sector uh, review and, and cleanup and so on and so forth. So people say that there was a financial sector cleanup. And they also say that they required people to bring new capital. I would say ask the entire banking system how many banks brought new money into the system. And you'll find that was very little. Many people restructured their balance sheets and, and, and through um, going, going about to, um, to revalue this, the, the positions, came up with additional capital, if you will, but, but very little new capital. Some that came from outside brought some the new capital, but very little capital got on the table, most of which was also taken away by the, 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 the haircuts from the bonds. Uh, so the system uh, is today facing a lot of stress. But our particular specific situation is this. We built a bank from the very beginning uh, saying that we wanted to be the people's bank, to be everywhere, to serve the ordinary Ghanaian. So from the word go, we said we're going to build at least 300 branch, branches and serve at least 1 million customers. And that we will be in where any major market is in this country and provide services across. So we built not just these 300 branches. In actual fact, we built 305. Um, and we put in the technology network so that no matter where you would be, whether it's in Wedana or Sisala or Pusiga or wherever, uh, that you could access your bank account from anywhere. Or you could also decide that um, I'm in Avrongo. I, I want to go to Kumasi or to Mokola to buy some supplies. But I don't want to carry, carry cash. So I, do, I, I don't lose it. So you go to the branch, you tell them, here's my money. I'm going to Kumasi Yedum, I'll collect my money. So they'll just you know, go safely, pick up their money, buy their supplies and go home. Uh, so we built this network, which then became the focal point for economic development in many of the areas. Uh, because now, if uh, I know a specific uh, man in Waliwali who sold building products, before we got there, he, his business was small because he couldn't drive to, through all these bad roads um, to go and deliver supplies, go and collect cash. But with our system in place, anyone, whether they're in Saboba or wherever else, will go to a branch, deposit money into his account. Once he verifies it's sitting in Waliwali, he will then send the supplies to them. And his business was thriving. Now the business has gone down. Okay. So we feel that collapsing a 300 branch financial entity is inimical 
inimical to the economic interest of the country. So whether it even belongs to us or belongs to someone else, it is something that needs to be there. Secondly, since our license was revoked and left a number of those places, nobody has gone to those locations. Nobody has decided that I'll go to, they are not here, so I'll go to Wolensi. They are not here, so I'll go to wherever it is. Nobody has gone there. And so there's nothing happening in those places. We had thousands of employees. Those employees don't have jobs. And because of the banking sector problem that showed up, who is going to give a branch manager a job today? So those people are jobless. Um, and they're, they're, some of them are doing some really menial jobs uh, with the education that they have. So that didn't happen. And there's a problem, there's a problem there. We also built a, a quite a sophisticated um, digital money system. So some may have heard about a system called Pay Global and, and others that we built with your app, you can do all sorts of things. That system obviously is collapsed. Now we built, we consider that we built one of the first, people talk about interoperability. We did this you know, more than six years ago. And that system, it doesn't work now. We made a huge investment in that area. It is not working. So we've spent a lot of money, a lot of investment in the system um, that today is, is, is not doing anything for anyone. So why did this happen? It happened because um, quietly we had been the entity, our whole group, that was funding Ghanaian contractors. There are a number of them, I know you know some of them, we put them in business. We finance uh, their, their contracts. So when uh, former President Kufo took over, they decided, and I was there, they decided that they weren't going to give advance money to contractors, that you should go and get your own money. And when your project gets to a certain phase, the professionals, technical people will go and take a look, certify the project, they pay you, uh, then you move on to the next phase. If they don't pay you in 90 days, you get to charge interest on it. Uh, and that was a system that was put in way back in 2001 or so, uh, because it was said that people would get advances and do all manner of things with the money uh, and not do the work. So up until 2017, cumulatively, we had financed up to 14 billion Ghana cities worth of contracts, cumulatively. That's the impact that we were having on the system, bridges, roads, school uh, buildings, and so on and so forth. Now, in, in 2008, when we started asking for our money, what we said was there at that time was 1.8 billion Ghana cities. Well, 18, oh, 20, 2018 was, was 1.8 billion uh, Ghana cities. And, and this came about because when the new administration took over in 2017, it decided to freeze all contracts and said they were going to review them and, and reject whichever ones that they would reject. Well, they did the review. None of our projects was rejected. As a matter of fact, they gave even more contracts to a number of the contractors that we, we had uh, pre-financed. But, but they would pay the new contracts and leave ours. Right? We said, just give us 300 million Ghana cities of contracts, work done and certified. And if they had done that, none of our companies would have suffered any any challenges. They didn't. So Ministry of Finance said, go and get an independent person to audit these projects, which we did. When the independent person did the audit, they rather came up with an amount of 2.2 billion Ghana cities. Right? This money is what today 
has come up to over 7.1 billion. Now, knowing all of this, the governor who is there sat with me and said, look, why don't you accept to be reclassified from a universal bank to a savings and loans company, knowing that for savings and loans, the minimum requirement is only 15 million. Okay, 15 million. Uh, so do that, continue with your business, and then when monies are paid, then you can come back and request to be brought back to universal banking status. I went back to the directors, said, okay, let's do this. So in January 2019, they give us a letter saying, here are six conditions that you must satisfy over a six month period. Uh, now go and become a savings and loans company. So we went and started working. After six months, we prepared this report. It's a transition report for the six month period. We gave it to them in July. All of the requirements that they gave us had been satisfied. And we said our capital at that point was about 200 million Ghana cities. Now remember savings and loans, you require 15 million, right? So imagine my shock when I'm sitting in Chicago doing some work and in, in August I'm told that they have taken our license. I said, under what, under what pretext, under what condition, what, 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 what happened? Okay? Because this report we gave to them, nobody called us to say, uh, come and let's talk page five, what you put there is wrong. Or page six, there's something that we don't understand. Nothing. Nothing. And I've been showing this to everybody, that we went through and did our work and said everything was okay. And indeed, um, the people had started coming back to us, giving us new money. The, you know, the old um, OPIC in, in, in Washington, which is now DFC, we went there and signed an agreement for $20 million okay, to, to bring in and put into the business. All of that went away because of this action. Presenting this petition to us. Um, it's a matter that has engaged our own attention, and I have made several pronouncements about it in the past. I believe that the action of this government was a knee-jerk reaction to a situation that should have been faced with reasonableness, level head, and a calm, a calm disposition. Um, Professor Soludo says that the ownership of capital matters and that the ethnicity of capital is real, and that every country's financial and banking sector is part of its national security architecture. And so I do believe that indigenous participation in the financial sector is critical. And the current lopsided situation where we have, have a dominance of foreign banks in the financial sector is not the best that uh, Ghana should have. And so you have a lot of empathy on this side. The issues with the financial sector began as under our watch. We knew there were liquidity issues and all that, but it needed a calm head to unravel it and deal with it. And so we went into putting in the necessary legislation, including the bill for guaranteeing deposits and so on and so forth, so that we could solidify the you know legislation in the financial sector and then deal with it you know when we came back with a renewed mandate it's not the first time we've uh, done a banking sector cleanup under finsa we had struggling banks and we dealt with it and the banks came out stronger after finsa than uh, before and you remember we created a non-performing assets recovery trust that took you know the toxic debt and dealt with it recovering those um, um, uh, uh, debts in this case i have said before that banks like yours uh, gn bank and ut bank and all the other banks that were closed were indigenous banks that were dealing mostly with small and medium enterprises. And everybody knows that in the banking sector, that is the risky end of the market. 
And so definitely, if there's going to be problems with liquidity, it's going to come from that, 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 that group. And so I believe government should have handled it differently. If we had continued in government, this would not have happened. I mean, we must look at the social impact to throwing out about 10,000 banking sector professionals. Some of them are bakers today, others are Uber drivers and all that. After all the training and education they got, I mean, the best practices that anybody could uh, look at, uh, I remember the Bank of Scotland or something during the financial crisis was about to collapse with massive consequences for the British economy. And so what did Britain do? They took equity in the bank, li uh, uh, liquefied the bank, and the bank, you know, returned to uh, profitability in a short while and took the equity back, paid it off, paid off the loans, we could have handled it that way. And in any case, who says that all banks require a certain capital reserve? And that's why we are talking about a tiered banking system, you know, because if banks exist for different purposes, they have different objectives, and they cater to different segments of the market. Not every bank needs to be a class A bank with capital reserves of 400 million CDs. They are small banks like, you know, Wells Women Banking and all those and other banks that cater for specific segments of the market and they don't need 400 million CDs capital because they're giving small loans like 1,000 CDs, 5,000 CDs, 2,000 CDs. They are not lending to the Unilevers of this world. And so I do think that government was hasty in what it did. If you look at the criteria that was used, I mean, it didn't fit. It was, uh, it was not a one size fit all. I mean, it was just like different rules for different different uh, folks. And so, yes, like you said, a lot of these banks had also financed government suppliers and contractors, and government owed them, and they owed the banks. And so even if you did an offset of what was owed, then probably the liquidity issue would have been resolved. But government says, no, no, our contract with those people has nothing to do with you. We are dealing with you as banks. And so it's your business to recover that money. But how would they recover that money if you don't pay the contractors to pay them? And so I do think that um, it was hasty and it's affected indigenous capital in the financial and banking sector and we have pledged that we would work to restore you know um, the uh, capital of indigenous businesses in the financial sector and so we are advocating an independent review of the processes that went into uh, the banking sector clean out and where we believe these were unjustifiable look at the restoration of the licenses of these banks the details are being worked out by our manifesto committee. He talked about an equity fund and all that. And so those are all things that we would look at. Um, it's a pity I go around the country and I see those your micro little brick and tile GN banks and they are firmly shut with padlocks. And I mean, there's no financial service to the community anymore after the closure of those little uh, mini banks. And then um, one would like to see them come back because we are looking to bring as many people into the formal sector as possible. And financial services are the best way to capture, you know, those people. And so <clears throat> we'll be happy to look at the petition. But like I said, I think we are speaking on the same wavelength. I know that there are some legal issues to outstanding, but it's something that we would be looking at before we come into office. And then, um, if by the grace of the votes of the Ghanaian people and by the grace of God we do come into office, you can expect that you will all get a sympathetic hearing, you know, in trying to unravel, you know, what has uh, uh, unfortunately happened. So, thanks again for presenting the petition, and uh, I wish you well. You're not looking as bad in real life as. <laughs> As the the photographs <laughs> make you look out to be. <laughs> There's one where you have your hands like this, and it's like the world has come to an end. <laughs> but thank you very much. Thanks for the honor. You know, we always say.